First, we would like to have a round of applause for the TED team for organizing this. <laughs> Thanks a lot for organizing this and having such a fun. Uh, you see, I'm, ooh, no, okay. Some of you might know me as Eric, but uh, actually, I am really concerned about our children. <laughs> By children, I, our children, I mean uh, Indian children. And the children, and the children around the world that actually do not have access to education. Uh, it's pretty cliche that Asian capital targets Indian Chinese guys. But, uh, yeah. So <coughs> what I want to talk about today is a project that Chinya and I uh, thought of. We had a vision of actually helping uh, the children who do not have access to education uh, and start with it so that we could have a more substantial role uh, in our society. And uh, well, I'm going to talk about firstly how we started with this, and then we're going to go on about what happened and what we, you know, what we think would, should happen in the future. So uh, it started in September, I think. It started, yeah, it started in mid September when uh, Chini called me and said, like, Yo, come to my room. I'm like, okay. And I go, I go to a Valley's room, one of our friends' room, and I see Chini with a towel naked and cooking Chinese duck. You know, it might be surprising to you that he was naked, but uh, it's as common for me as to see that my girlfriend naked. He's always naked. <laughs> it's very common for me to see it with a towel rather than with cooking something. And so he, he just looks at me and says, you know, Kunal is sitting here in LH and we're bored. I think you and I should do something. <laughs> I look at her and I'm like, I just look at her and I say, you need to get your clothes for us. <laughs> and so afterwards, but he told me about his vision. Basically, his vision was uh, to not fall in the trap of ex insignificance. He believed that individual action could actually change the world, and this is where we started from. So we had this vision about helping helping children and actually going to that place. If you want to make a difference, you need to go to that place and to communicate with people to know what is wrong, actually. So we started going on the internet and searching. First, we searched China, but uh, being Asians, we're cheap, so we can't really afford our flights to China. So we dropped that idea. Then we thought of uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, an NGO that actually helps in building houses. But we thought that it wasn't really very appropriate for us because, firstly, you have to pay to them to actually build houses. Secondly, you never really get to communicate with the community. And uh, thirdly, we didn't want our res ourselves to restrict to just building houses. So we then uh, went uh, and searched on India, and we found this organization uh, called Pratham. And Pratham is an organization that was it's an NGO that was founded in 1994 by UNICEF and the government of India. And it's actually one of the biggest organizations in India. Sadly, I didn't know about it, but now I do. Uh, so uh, what we thought, uh, so we learned more about Pratham. And what Pratham actually does is it provides free education to children who are, who cannot afford it, whose parents cannot afford it, or whose parents are not there and they still have a uh, will to study on. Uh, so we contacted them, and uh, through our co uh, through our contact, we found that they're actually willing for us to uh, show them around India and the different centers because it has centers in every state of India, and especially they're very big in Mumbai and uh, Delhi. So the thought of going to Mumbai and checking out all all their centers and uh, what they actually do. And after we were done with knowing that what we uh, do, we had to find people because. I mean, two people cannot really do much. So we, so we uh, started, well, it's not really recruiting, but we started uh, thinking uh, who could be. I mean, we needed people who are dynamic would adjust the situation because we ourselves didn't know what we were actually getting ourselves into. And we're actually uh, very honest and very hardworking. Uh, so we have, we founded three more uh, 
member to uh, Pavan, uh, Elin, and uh, Piet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, I'm, I'm here speaking because uh, me and Sneem like to speak. Like, one of the first advice I got from mom is to keep my mouth shut and ears open. And you can see how easily I follow that. But, uh, so, but really, they are the actual backbone of our team. They are the ones that actually make us. They're actually the ones that make this organization, this project, Country Falls Project Athena. And so after we're done with uh, recruiting, uh, you know, with getting these people and talking about like, so we're gonna do this, book flights, and then we're sitting in uh, Chinese room and we actually thought, what is our actual aim? What do we wanna achieve? Because if you think about just promoting education in a country, for example, in India, a country as big as India, it's very impossible for you to, uh, to come to make a difference. So our aim was basically to <coughs> Uh, promote education and reduce child labor, and to increase the opportunity for people who are actually extremely talented. They're extremely, uh, they're extremely capable, and they have extreme will to uh, study, but they cannot because of their circumstances. So what we wanted to do when we went to Mumbai is to actually go there and find those children so we could, uh, uh, we could educate them, we could provide them for a better education. So why did we choose to help education specifically in India? The, ed the importance of education has never been more important than it is today in this era of modernization. In India, the literacy rate is a mere 65%, and only 7% of the students graduate from secondary education. As you can see from this picture, good education is very hard to come, uh, come by for those who are disadvantaged. I mean, something as basic as spelling the days of the week is a, is a luxury for a lot of the population of India, those who are stuck in poverty. And we believe as you know, Canal Indians, you know, we have this connection with the community and we wanted to go to somewhere where we could really connect with the people. And um, India, we thought, was of paramount importance to the world today because India has such a large and vibrant youth community. Um, the youth community itself, however, is not, the potential of this community is not tapped into. As I've said, only 7% of the Indian youth graduate from secondary school. So you can see here that there's a lot of potential that is not taken because of their disadvantaged circumstances, because of something arbitrary that they themselves are not able to control. <coughs> So we see as um, a student from Film Society, we understand the <laughs> importance of education, right? I mean, that's why we're sitting in this room. That's why we are here, to educate ourselves and to further ourselves. <coughs> and we, as a team, wanted to give this opportunity to people who may not necessarily have the advantages that we do based on the virtue that we live in uh, liberal democracies. We take a lot of our education and in India, we thought that because there is such problems with education, this is something that uh, is a pursuit worthy of uh, our time, basically. And so the government of India has, in fact, passed a bill called the Right to Education Act, which states that every child up till the age of 14 has the right to free and equal education. So you can see that the Indian government already has a de jure system of education, of mandatory education. There is initiative from the Indian government. However, the problem with this lies in that the people of India, those who are actually in the slums, those who are actually affected by um, their disadvantaged um, backgrounds, those who actually need this bill, they don't know about this bill. And there lacks a severe, um, there's a severe gap in a de facto grassroots implementation of the law. And many of those schools refuse to implement this law and they take advantage of the fact that people don't really know what's going on and they don't know their rights. So we as a team, we thought that this was a good opportunity for us to change the world in a very slight manner, but still change the world nonetheless. And so since we believe that there's not enough that's being done to bridge the gap in the vastly diverse and vastly different education levels in India, some of the most 
some of the richest people live in Mumbai, but it is also home to some of the poorest people, and not enough is done to bridge this gap. And we feel that between the uh, socioeconomic groups, we as a team of five can actually go to India, see what is going on, and make a difference in someone's lives. And because India is such an important place uh, for the world, and there is such a vibrant community of youth population, we felt that this is a pursuit um, worthy of our time, as I had said earlier. So we had, we had two goals in India. The first goal was to promote education, and our secondary goal was to reduce child labor, as you can see from the slide. A main reason why people do not go to school is because, first of all, they're poor, they can't afford it. And in order to compensate for this, their parents force them to work like the child here selling watches on the streets, and they do not have the time because for the parents, it's a cost um, benefit analysis, and they feel that their children should be better served if they were to gain money, to earn money for food. And we feel by creating a program that actually directly addresses these problems with the perspective of students, something that isn't often done because you know, students, we think of ourselves as insignificant. We don't think that we can actually contribute to difference. With this unique perspective of students helping students, we feel that um, India was a place to do it, and India gave us the opportunity to make a difference. Okay, so, well, now we just uh, feel like, like we know what we were thinking, and it looks kind of superficial. But uh, I want to talk about what we uh, actually did in India when we went this winter. Well, firstly, we, we, when we went down to Mumbai, uh, we had a couple of problems. Firstly, that Pierre and Chinny can't eat spicy food. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like, just, just a little. And like, you know, we're eating, we're eating a burger and then Pierre just gets up like, this is spicy, man, this burger is so spicy. I mean, you, you just find everything spicy, everything spicy. Like, and then, we met a uh, guy called Ishani, who's just waiting to, to like, there as well. Um, then we went to Shari, which was a great help because she is from Mumbai and she helped us to find different places to eat with Mark Spice. She got Mark Spice. Yeah. Okay, but uh, what we did when we went there first was we met the organization properly. To know, first, to, before to go to the places, we need to know what, what is Mumbai like. I've never been to Mumbai, I've never been outside of Delhi where I live. So it was. Yeah, so it was kind of uh, weird. But we met the official and the, the Pratham officials, and they said, just take care of two things. Firstly, that Indian society is very conservative. Secondly, that there's a lot of corruption where you're going. So we, we started off by going to uh, Gobigat. Sorry. Yeah. So we started by going to Gobigat. And Gobigat is probably is the biggest place where clothes, clothes from it's said that every every clothes that in Mumbai has at least gone through once to Gobigat. It's a really big place where workers work and uh, wash clothes for uh, household, for company, for hotels, for everyone. And as we was as we were trying to enter, uh, these guys stopped us from filming. They stopped filming Pierre and uh, us. They said that we have to pay money for for all of this. So we just started realizing, okay, this is the first time first time corruption. So we paid them money because we actually wanted to look at what is actually happening there. And we went there and it was it was just an eye-opening experience for all of us. We saw children aged from 12 to 14 uh, who were, were working there washing uh, washing clothes. And uh, I, like for example, this girl we interviewed and she is she's actually nine years old. And we interviewed her and you just you could see her hands. They were all decayed by the chemical water uh, that she washes, and they were all wrinkled. She looked really old, but there was this confidence in her eyes because she's gone through so much only by being in age six. She had this confidence in her eyes. She just looked at me, and I, I asked her, "So, like, what are you doing? Why are you washing clothes? Like, why do you care?" So she was extremely confident and. Uh, I asked her, like, don't you want to be educated? Like, 
don't you want to learn something in school? Do you want to go to school? And she said, and this is, and this, the answer she said is basically the most of the stu uh, children in India who are poor can't go, don't go to school. She said, both my parents are beggars on, uh, on, the, on the railway station upstairs, and I need to earn some money for a living. Now tell me, should I go and study, or should I earn to for something for my family so we can survive? And, you know, I just, I just went down like a sack of potatoes. I was, I was just like, really, no, like really, I was just like shocked that, I mean, I'm sitting, I, I always, I'm, I'm here in this city and I, I just, I never think of these things. Like, why are, I'm, I'm just always thinking that why don't they just educate? Why isn't it that simple that a government provides free education? But it's, it's, uh, it's about survival for them more than education. And, like after that, I just interviewed another boy who was working. He was 12 years old, and he he wouldn't even he wouldn't even talk to me. He said he, he was just trying to ignore me because he, he has already answered that question so many times that that he just uh, wants to escape and just wants to do his work. And uh, he he ran from his village and to earn to earn a living because uh, his parents used to beat him up. So he just said, I, I just want to be independent and. He thought that this is this is just his world. He's he's not been out of Dhubi Ghat uh, in his entire life. He gets food, there's a shop in Dhubi Ghat. He's never been out of that confined place. Because he just thinks that outside is just a whole different world where he doesn't belong. And after when we when we're walking back to the hotel, we were just uh, we're just wondering like, is this the worst thing that we have seen? Like what there's nothing worse than that if you see uh, children aged from 9 to 12 not thrown in the hands of uh, decaying. And the next day, uh, we went to this place called Govendi. Uh, we don't have a picture of that, sorry. Oh, that's a beautiful guy, come on. Uh, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a picture of Govendi because we're not allowed to here. Because uh, it's, it's actually a very, uh, it's not safe, it's not safe at all. But uh, we went to Govendi and we were going in this auto rickshaw and then Pierre and I, uh, so we, we look and there's a, there's a hill. We, we, we went with a Pratham official. We see there's a hill and then I just, I just, I just told the official, like, wow, you guys, like, this is where the slum is, there's a hill, it's like, it looks pretty nice. And uh, she said, this is not a hill, <coughs> it's a mountain of dumps. It's the, the dumps, uh, the right next to the slum of Govindi was as big as the city. It's extremely, it's extremely, it's extremely huge. And we see there uh, children just walking there, trying to find something, maybe to eat or trying, trying something to actually like get something so they could sell and earn some money. And we went there and uh, we went there and talked to the Pratham centers. Uh, in, in, in this center, one of the teacher that was educating these children was uh, was actually thrown acid on the face. So it's a, it's a very unsafe place. And we tried to interview children, and uh, what we, we saw, and then uh, we saw how it, it's, it's, it's just this small of a classroom, and there are 20 children in that, basically. And they, but, but it's just that education is important, and they have a will to actually, uh, to actually study. So what we see is, uh, so, uh, and then the teacher actually pointed out to me these two girls that have actually been um, molested and raped by their brothers. And they, because they were going for education, because they were going to study in this Pratham Center, but they ran away and now the Pratham takes care of them. And it just shows the characteristics of like the strength these girls have, that the, the importance they feel, that we take education for granted here, we're sitting here, and we just say, oh my God, well, why do we have law lecture today? Like, let's not go for it. But for them, it's extremely important. And strength is not really about physical capacity, it's about, not the indomitable will an individual really has. And I mean, each time we, one like faces our, our fears, we gain strength. And this is how the girl told me that she gained strength by, by continuously having been feared what her brother did to uh, her. Yeah, okay. So after coming back, where do we move from here? How do we make contributions when we're in law? So as I, I told you earlier, we have two primary goals. First is to raise awareness. And 
and second, this will make a concrete difference in these people's lives. And we believe that the two are intrinsically intertwined because without awareness, you cannot possibly actually have the means to change um, to change their lives to provide for them the education that they desperately require. And what can we do here? We are creating a scholarship program for five of the children that are currently in Prasam right now. That's Prasam Take Tip. They're creating scholarships so that five of these children go to secondary school, can finish their diploma, and move on to tertiary education. And that is the concrete kind of aim that we have for these children to do. But perhaps more um, awareness-based, what can we actually do? We want to create a Prasam chapter in Kyoto. We want to um, spread awareness. And what we have done in Mumbai is that we wrote journals, and every day we wrote about what we saw, the feelings that we had, the feelings that the children have, and we aim to publish this in a travel in order to raise awareness. And also, um, our team member, Pierre, he's working on a short film right now, and it's basically to capture the attention of the world, because we don't think that education, everybody knows that there's a serious problem in it, but nobody really knows how bad it actually is. What we are trying to do is bring to you, students, young people, the youth, bring to you the image, how powerful these images are, what they are going through every day that we think is, um, we really think it's an exception, but to them, that's their reality. And perhaps one of the most famous Indian people um, you know, that's ever lived, the Mahatma Gandhi, he said, that everything you do will be insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. We have far too long been trapped in the first part. We believe that everything we do will be insignificant. We're just one of many. However, I say no to that. I say everything we do is significant. Everything we do has a butterfly effect. And everything we do has the power to change the world. Everything you do has the power to change the world. Thank you.